Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Paul Roberts, and uh, it's my pleasure uh, to share with you a little bit of the exhibition that we have on at the Ashmolean Museum at the moment, of which I am the curator. Um, I'm the head of the Antiquities Department, so it's a suitable exhibition, and it's Last Supper in Pompeii, and it really is a love affair. It's all about the Roman relationship with food, and how food and wine come into every area of Roman life. Many cultures have this relationship with food, but only with Pompeii do we have the evidence from the production to the consumption and even the waste. So Pompeii provides us with this amazing uh, overview. And here, a fresco, everything, virtually everything that's movable that you see in the exhibition, uh, that you see in the presentation, is in the exhibition. Um, this fresco, diners, drinkers, people reclining on couches, Greek-style luxury, men and women reclining together, unheard of in the Greek world. So it looks at the customs, it looks at the practicalities, and it looks also at the religious side. Now, it involved a lot of work, about two and a half years spent in Naples. Um, <laughs> it was hell, it was hell, but something had to do it. And of course we also look in the exhibition at the other side of food, the taverns, the bars, the street food, because that's a very important part of the Roman story of nutrition. The story goes back to 1976, when a very gawky Paul Roberts, with his late mum there, bless her, um, we went to Pompeii and Naples, no staying in Sorrento for my mum, oh no, she was born in the back streets of Plymouth, so we stayed in Naples itself went to Pompeii, went to Herculaneum. She was one of the jolliest people you would ever meet. But it's very difficult to be jolly when you're surrounded by the body casts in Pompeii. And it was that moment, I remember, that made me think the Romans are real people. They're not gladiators, they're not emperors, they're us. And that moment in the house made me decide, okay, I'm a Roman archaeologist, and what's more, I am an unashamedly populist Roman archaeologist. I like the ordinary people. Um, these are our main lenders. Bless them and save them. You have Pompeii, you have the National Museum at Naples, you have the British Museum, and us, the Ashmolean. I should say that the exhibition runs until January the 12th of January next year. It's the longest exhibition we've actually done in the Ashmolean's history. When you come in, you'll be confronted by that beautiful fresco showing the luxury, showing the reclining, but you'll also see him. And he shows the other very important strand, the gods. Gods and superstition are everywhere with the Romans. You can't produce, buy, sell, cook, eat anything without recourse to the gods. And Bacchus, the god of wine, the god of fertility, a beautiful statue of Bacchus with, of course, his panther down bottom right, because Bacchus is an exotic god. Like wine, he comes from the east. But where did the Romans get their ideas from? They didn't invent the idea of the banquet. A lot of their ideas came from the other peoples in Italy, like the Etruscans. And you'll see some wonderful burial chests, beautifully coloured, because on high days and holidays, you went back into the tomb, and you banqueted and drank with great-grandmama and great-grandpapa. Hence, you saw the tombs all the time. So it was very important that they were beautiful. And look how they show themselves reclining, as if at a banquet. Hold that image in your mind. You'll need it a lot later on. And in the tombs of the Etruscans, what do we find except vessels for drinking and eating? Even a little barbecue, so you could rustle up a quick snack in the tomb. They have an idea that why exclude the dead from the most important process of life? And the Romans continue that idea. Um, also, of course, the Romans dine men and women together, just like the Etruscans did. Not just the Etruscans, though. Uh, we have this wonderful site, Paestum, a Greek site down south of Pompeii, taken over by the Italians, the Italic peoples, the Lucanians. And the Romans inherit this palimpsest of influences, Greeks, Etruscans, Italics, 
and the Romans benefit from little bits of all of their cultures. This is painted interior from a tomb from Pystum, never before seen in the UK. First time they've lent them to Britain. And it shows food present in the funerary procession. Little slave carrying eggs and pomegranates. Another slave carrying a table laden with loaves of bread. And so food and drink present at every major event. A wonderful bronze jar dating to the Greek period from Pystum. Inside was found what can only be referred to as gunk. <laughs> and the gunk is being analysed as we speak and we believe it might be degraded honeycomb. Honeycomb put into the jar for the gods for the afterlife. But not just the gods, because people have things put into their tombs. Cups and dishes that may have been full of food and wine but they decay, they go not the terracotta food that we see here from Pystum it'll never finish, it'll never rot and you have amazing things bunches of grapes you have fruit, you have ricotta cheese and what is that if it is not a custard cream biscuit? <laughs> <laughs> so where did the Romans get their food from? And we fly to the Bay of Naples, this wonderful fresco that comes from a slave's shrine to the gods, the slave's quarters of the House of the Centenary. And what does it show? It shows Mount Vesuvius, it shows Bacchus, so fertile he's turned into a bunch of grapes. He's giving his panther a quick drink, and the snake of good fortune, the Agatha Daimon, comes to devour the sacrifice on the altar and take it to the gods. The snakes are sometimes good in Roman religion, but this shows how important wine was to the area. The slaves knew that their good well-being depended on their master's well-being, and their master's well-being clearly they realised was linked to Vesuvius, to wine. And evidence of this is everywhere. Everywhere you go down near Pompeii, you find wineries. And this vineyard was excavated by Mark Robinson from the Natural History Museum. And 15 feet below a modern vineyard being redeveloped for building was a Roman vineyard. With the earth banked up, even the holes for the vines and the stakes that supported them. And on Vesuvius, it's covered in vineyards. And this is a pergola vineyard, just like the ones that Mark discovered there. And he even discovered in the soil the marks showing the direction in which the peasant was walking when he hoed the soil. That's how well preserved the surface of the soil was. And still today, when you go to Vesuvius, the ludicrously rich volcanic soil is wonderful for grapes, for vines. And this is a vineyard where we went during the press trip in May and had a very enjoyable time. And, uh, no, well, well, we, we suffered. It was awful. It was, it was terrible. Um, so you see all around you today evidence of how things were. And this is a fascinating farm, a place called Bosco Reale. It's a winery again. And it had a wine yard with these big jars, dolia, each containing 20 amphoras of wine, and each amphora is eight gallons. So these, this is a big production of wine. The biggest one is 84 of these dolia. So you get the sense of an industrial scale production of wine. And the archaeologists have actually replanted uh, the wine around it, the vines. But that's not all you need, of course. You need the distribution. And nearby, at Oplantis, they found a site called Villa B. And Villa B was an import-export emporium. The archaeologists discovered 1,200 wine amphoras upside down, ready to take wine from other farms and export it. And they also found a metric tonne of pomegranates. So it's food and wine being brought together in these distribution depots and then exported. It's a wholesale, if you like, a, a kind of cash and carry. Um, and I should say that we'll come back to the Emporium because it was there a real tragedy unfolded. The archaeologists found 60 bodies huddled in one of the storerooms. We'll come back to that sadly later. Um, and you would have had herds and flocks of pigs and sheep and goats. Not so much beef. The Romans didn't like beef in Italy, it seems. In Britain they loved it, but not in Italy. There was also uh, fish sauce production. Pompeii was on the coast. 
in Roman times. So you have the famous fish sauce. A man called Scaurus, Scauri, was so proud of how he'd earned his money, he put a mosaic, or four mosaics to be precise, into his entrance hall with his fish sauce bottles shown on them. It's like Mr. Hines having a carpet with sauce bottles. <laughs> And uh, olive oil wasn't a huge produce uh, around Pompeii because they imported a lot. Nonetheless, this bottle of olive oil it dates to AD 79. And when the courier came along, we asked whether we could lift the lid. And he said, OK. So we lifted the lid. It smells like olive oil. It's not rancid. It's not off. And that smell really stays with you. That is a smell of AD 79. Quite extraordinary. Um, and then you transport all your things into the city by boat, by slave, by cart, and then into the streets. The streets were noisy, loud, smelly, and brightly coloured. There were pictures everywhere. There were the lower part of the walls were always painted red, but the upper parts were covered in images of gods and animals and graffiti and adverts. And when you look at modern Neapolitan streets, you see the same thing. It's impossible to see houses. It's shops everywhere. They called us a nation of shopkeepers. The Pompeians could teach us a thing or two. And here, find the house. It's actually there. All the rest are shops. And when you come to Pompeii, you see these wide, open-fronted shops everywhere. There they are. There's one with a counter, which we can classify, therefore, as a bar. But here is an open-fronted shop. And that's how they were. Wide open fronts. Let the air in, let the light in, let the customers in. This is typical of the Pompeian shops. And here's a tavern, the tavern of Vitutius Placidus. And you've got one of these distinctive counters with the jars set in, hot and cold drinks, and the gods looking over everything. A shrine of the gods protecting you, your customers, and your produce. And from a bar near the arena in Pompeii, there was a marvellous opportunity in Pompeii, they discovered in the 1950s a shop bar which had a bar garden at the back for drinking wine as a break from the arena. And there were 40 or 50 pots found in this shop. And for the first time ever, Pompeii allowed a foreign institution to take the pots home and conserve them. So we've been conserving 35 of these pots. And it's quite extraordinary, the stories they tell. Um, pots for serving and cooking and this one we thought was for holding water and only yesterday we heard that they have found concreted into the copper at the bottom of the pan larvae insect larvae so in its last phase of life it was being used to store meat or fish because they burrowed in to the meat and then got fossilized into the coating of the pot so we're finding out so much by doing the conservation um, and in the bars, you have wine from all over the world. You have food from all over the world. This is a, a jar of wine from the island of Rhodes. And this is the finest Roman wine. Fal, Falernian. This is the wine that the poet Horace raves about. And this is the only example from Pompeii of Falernian wine. Now, those of a nervous disposition, please look away because your bar needed protection. And what better protection could there be than a ruddy great phallic lamp? <laughs> and this is practical because it gives light. And of course, there's no organized lighting system in the streets of Pompeii. Private individuals light their own shops and bars. So you have a lamp there, uh, you have a lamp there, um, and to give added protection, you hang bells from it. And this is guaranteed to keep away the evil spirits. And here is a modern shop in the streets of Naples, wide open front, people going in. Um, the gods, where are the gods? Well, there they are. There's the Virgin Mary, there's St. Francis, there's Padre Pio. The gods are in the shop just as they were in the Roman shop. But where's the phallic amulet, you say? <laughs> it's over here. This is the cornu, the horn, the chili pepper. Ladies and gentlemen, it is neither a horn nor a chili pepper. <laughs> um, the streets were full of colour. This is a pub sign, the sign of the golden phoenix. Phoenix, felix et tu. The Felix is lucky, may you be lucky too. And that wall painting was lucky because it was cut from the walls in the 1950s. The rest of that street has lost every single scrap of its plaster. 
but that luckily was taken off and stored in the superintendency. And it's not all shops, it's not all buying and selling. This is a stall that looks like it's selling bread. It's not selling it at all. The bread stall seller is wearing a toga. He's not a slave selling bread, he's a politician giving loaves away. Can you imagine politicians being crooked and underhand? <laughs> um, and there is a Pompeian loaf, preserved as it was on the 20th of October, not August, AD 79. And why do I say October? Because figs are present, pomegranates are present, and also, very importantly, that winery that we saw, and many other wineries, have closed their dolia. The vintage is in. That is physically impossible by the end of, of August. But it's not by the end of October, which is one of the alternative dates given in the manuscripts. And Giorgio Locatelli had a go at making a Pompeian loaf, with some success, I must say. Um, let's go into the house, into the Pompeian house. You have the atrium, the entrance area. This is a public-private space. Your clientes, your dependents come into your home. If you've got a home like this, you have dependents. And what do you do? You wow them with your decoration, your ancestors, and your shrine of the gods. And in the exhibition, we've got some beautiful marble furniture, paintings uh, that would have been there, and also the shrine, including a little bronze piggy that's dedicated to her, i.e. to Hercules, because Hercules was the legendary founder of Pompeii, so features very often in these lararia, in these shrines. And these again Mark Robinson's excavations from a garden in Pompeii the remains of the sacrifices that you would have burnt on the little altar in your atrium and it's got eggshell bits of pine nuts pine cones and a chicken that is the smallest wishbone I've ever seen in my life but it's part of a chicken that would have been sacrificed burnt to the gods in a ceremony perhaps every week perhaps every day into the garden. The Romans don't invent gardens, but they invent the idea of putting them in the centre of the house, and they fill them with beautiful plants and trees, some of which may be practical, medicinal, fruit trees, but others are just beautiful. Roses, lilies, irises. And in the exhibition we've got examples planting out pots into which you could put your plants, plant them in lovely arrangements, the remains of which have been found by the archaeologists, and wonderful things with water. The Romans bring piped water to Pompeii in around the year zero. And where do the Romans put it? In their bathrooms? No. In their bedrooms? No. In the garden. They put it in the garden because that's where you impress your guests. And this is a water distributor. distributor. Um, it's a baby because the biggest one I've seen had 12 nozzles that would send off to different pools and fountains. Ours in the exhibition has only three, but nonetheless it's a nice idea of the technology that the Romans had mastered. And look at these beautiful fountain spouts. That bronze spout. When you go and see him, look at the details of his straw hat. His hat has been shown as if it's woven. It's quite extraordinary. And the tortoise. And we've even got a real tortoise that was bumping around a garden in Pompeii. The finest rooms in the house looked over the garden. A dining room from the house of the Prince of Naples. And in our exhibition, we have frescoes too from a dining room, from the house of the Golden Bracelet. And they arrived like this. Three ruddy great crates, which have to be handled oh so carefully. And here they're peeling off the cover and then assembling them into that. And that is one wall of a fine dining room they could show mythology, they could show still life, or in this case, a trompe l'oeil effect of a garden. And actually, at the end of the dining room, you looked out onto the real garden. So it was a 360 degree illusion. And beautiful furniture. This lovely bronze, th this is the nicest lamp stand you'll ever see. You put lamps on the acanthus frond here, and it illuminates your banquet. Um, and there he is being excavated in 1922. Uh, he's an Ephib, a young man, and he gave his name to the house, the House of the Ephib. 
And you can see there the reality of the burial of Pompeii. A quick lesson in the eruption, Vesuvius hadn't erupted for centuries in AD 79. So when it erupts, it's very violent. It's an explosive eruption, rather like Mount St. Helens in America some years ago. And it creates a great volcanic cloud. And this cloud stays up for about a day, more or less. Collapses every now and again, but goes back up. As long as it stays up, you're safe. Run, move quickly, get away. But within about an hour, it starts to drop the heavier material in the form of a rainfall of stones, lapilli. And that is what buries Pompeii. And good thing too, because it's the lapilli that preserve everything. Because when the cloud collapses, it produces a pyroclastic surge, which is three to 400 degrees centigrade and like a bulldozer and traveling at 70 miles an hour. And it smashes everything in its way. So only things that were preserved by these stones actually survived the eruption. Let's go into the dining room. The dining room is called the triclinium. It's the room of the three couches, kline, the Greek word for couch. And here you see a picture, foreshortened, one, two, three. Guests are reclining. You recline in fine dining. You don't sit at table. In the pub, you sat at the table. When you were having a snack in a fine house, even, you would sit at a table. But for fine dining, to impress your guests, you recline. Recline on your left-hand side also. It's been shown that it improves the digestion. Um, guests are arriving, slaves are giving them cups of wine, taking their shoes. Um, it's wrong to think of an ideal type of slavery. Uh, the life of slaves was, was brutal even in a decent home. This guest has had far too much already. Um, and the other guests in luxury, these beautiful fittings, looking at the wall paintings and the frescoes. And uh, it could get completely out of hand. Here's a lady who's had far too much to drink being supported by a slave. And there's her companion, uh, whose arm only is visible because he's fallen off the couch. Um, so the Romans didn't separate out the drink and the food. They were very much intermarried. So it would be one course, drink. One course, drink. And no banqueting tables, notice. These small, round tables. Lots of courses in small quantities. That was the Roman way of eating. And eat off silver. Never hide your light under a bushel in the Roman world. If you've got money, show you've got money. And here are some of the tableware, silver, but also pottery for the less wealthy. And we get to the point where we think, well, what did the Romans actually eat? The Romans had a phrase, abovo usque ad malum, from the egg to the apple. And main meal was at 8 o'clock, your cana. If you were in a pub, you'd be having a stew of beans and some cheap meat or some sausages or pasties or things like that. Um, but if you were rich, you'd sit down to cena and it would be a series of courses. And here, eggs to start off the meal. Eggs. But you'd also have your greens at this point. You'd have asparagus, peas, beans, cucumbers, onions, mushrooms. You'd have um, cheese. You'd have olives. You'd have small meats. You'd have fish, light poultry, that kind of thing. Um, garum would be everywhere. Garum, the fish sauce. Uh, the best fish sauce, according to Marshall, was made from the blood of a still gasping mackerel. Mm, delicious. Um, and, I, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't warn you. Dormice. This is a cooked dormouse from a festival in Croatia where they still eat them. Seriously, folks. Um, and when you look at it, you think, oh, but I thought dormice were tiny. Field dormice are tiny. This is a glis glis. This is an edible dormouse. And I was assured by a specialist in dormice who visited me last week that when you have a well-fed dormouse... It's, it's rather like a bean bag with legs. They are big. Um, when you see the dormouse in the exhibition, um, he's a baby who hasn't eaten very much, according to the expert. Um, they love depicting food in their art. The cockerel here, shown petting at a pomegranate. And of course, the conceit is that the cockerel eats the pomegranate, we eat the cockerel. Roman power over food. And this dear little rabbit. 
um, a, a, a rabbit eating figs and again we are going to eat the rabbit and I'm afraid there's a recipe for the womb of a sterile sow take the womb of a sterile sow add pepper cumin leeks rue garum and meat add mincemeat peppercorns pine kernels press into the well washed womb cook in water oil garum with a bouquet of leeks and dill it's a haggis it's a haggis and of course there was no refrigeration so sausages haggises things that you could cook and dry and smoke would be very useful indeed and then if you've got any space left it's time for puddings and fruit was the mainstay of the dessert table and they had figs peaches plums grapes apples pears a lot of which they exported of course to britain um, here's beautiful figs from the villa at Aplontis, and here are figs from pompeii that are in the exhibition um, and these figs are coupled figs figs that have been cut opened up smeared with honey and then another fig put on the top of them and they feature in Roman art. There they are. They're not peanuts, they're coupled figs. So sometimes the art can preserve things that, unless we had Pompeii, would be lost forever. And all around you, beautiful art. Um, this wall painting, very important, showing Europa. Now, three months after the opening, we should have been in Brexit. And so we asked the director of Naples Museum if, as a special favour, as a reminder that we're part of Europe, we could have this beautiful wall painting. And she said, yes, um, it's not going back on October the 31st. <laughs> <laughs> and beautiful mosaics. Look at this gorgeous emblem, a highly decorative central motif that would go in the middle of your three couches, sea creatures. It's very heavy because it's set in a marble tray. So valuable was it that when you moved house, you could take it with you. Um, so the guy's mounting it there on the wall. And there were beautiful things all around, including antiques. This is an antique jar that was found in the house of a man called Julius Polybius and he had put his collection of antiques into one of the rooms when the eruption started and gradually his heart must have broken because gradually it all got buried by the stones that were coming in from the garden and coming in through the impluvium and the atrium roof and gradually his antiques would have been buried and in fact he and his family we believe it is the family were found in the room next to this amazing collection that jar came from Greece originally and it was made in 450 BC. It comes, so an inscription says, from the games of the Queen of the Gods, Hera, in the Greek city of Argos and somehow it made its way to Pompeii and got buried in AD 79, by which time it was 525 years old. So the Romans, like us, liked old things, they liked antiques. And there's another one of his treasures. It's a statue of the god Apollo. And in later life, in the 1970s, it was excavated. I love this excavator. Look at the 70s jumper and the fag hanging out the mountain. Wonderful. Uh, but this is the 1970s. And what he's doing is shoveling away the lapilli, the stones, because again, they preserved this amazing statue. And you can see him in the exhibition. He's now in the show. Um, and originally, uh, when the archaeologists found him, he had two supports set into his hands. In last years of his use, he'd been adapted as a tray bearer to take the empties from a banquet. I mean, poor Apollo, honestly. <laughs> um, but we can't display those bits because he's on open display. You can actually go up to him. Please don't touch him. But you can go up to him. You can admire those amazing eyes, the eyes made of stone and silver and glass. Um, eyes never survive in bronze statues. Bronze statues are rare, full stop, but the eyes hardly ever survive. So to have the two bronzes, the Ephib and him, with their eyes, they alone are worth going to see the exhibition for. I, I'm unbiased when I say that. <laughs> they are masterpieces of Roman art which rarely travel. 
Um, but they're still excavating today. The Director General of Pompeii, Director Massimo Zanna, who is coming to give us a talk about this very subject on the 31st of October. You heard it here first. Uh, they're still excavating for purposes of conservation to try and improve the flow of water because climate is changing in Italy as well. Their summers, their winters and their autumns are getting wetter and it's flooding, it's waterlogging the Lapilli. And this is causing all sorts of trouble. It's pressing against excavated walls. It's ruining frescoes by sending water up through the walls and salts coming out of the frescoes. So they're trying to trim back the Lapilli and improve the water flow. And in doing so, they're finding incredible treasures. Look at this amazing fresco of Leda and the Swan. The Swan being the god Zeus. Leda is going to be seduced by the god Zeus. He is a swan. She is therefore going to give birth with an egg. And in the egg is going to be Helen of Troy. And we know where that leads to. So this first mosaic, this uh, fresco, as bright as the day it was painted. And this is how all frescoes emerged from the Lapilli of Pompeii. But if they're not covered over, then the sun destroys them, the rain destroys them, and I'm afraid mindless tourists destroy them as well. Look at this. This isn't a fine fresco. Well, it is. It's a beautiful fresco, but it's on a bar counter. This is a bar counter with the amphorae from the bar still in front of it. And a quite a famous photo that made it to the BBC news page. This poor man. Um, he'd almost made it to safety. And then the lintel of the door that he was heading for dropped on him. And doesn't that remind us? Carpe diem. A wonderful mosaic from a dining room. Not my idea of a dining room floor decoration, but for the Romans, perfect. Because death was closer to the Romans. Infant mortality was shocking. The average expectancy of life, I'm 50, what am I, 58? I'm doing very well by Roman standards. Very well indeed. Um, so disease, rampant in the empire. So he's a reminder the, the banquet, which is the apex of living. The word in Roman for a banquet is a convivium. Convivium. You live together, you bring together, you enjoy. Because the alternative is this. But you know, even death isn't too bad, because he's bringing the wine jugs. <laughs> we can have a great time before we go. And there is one of the wine jugs that death was holding. We've got one in the exhibition. And thinking of wine, the Romans were terrible wine snobs. And this is connected with the wine ceremony. The Greeks put wine and water into a crater, big vase, mixed it up, dished it out, off you go. Not the Romans. Inheriting probably ideas from the Etruscans, they had an ornate ceremony. The slaves took wine around and put some in each cup. But then another slave would go around with a tray of herbs and honey and spices. And each guest would mix how they fancied. And then you'd come around with the hot water dispenser, which is what this is, a samovar. And then a little bit of hot water with your wine, sir, madam. You know, you'd make your own concoction. And when you go to Italy today, you go to a bar, how many different types of coffee are there? Well, with the Romans, it was their wine. And that's the inside of the water heater. That's the reservoir for the charcoal. And the water is in the outside. There's how it works. Into the kitchen. Estate agents say the kitchen is the room that sells the house. Not in a Roman house. Oh, no, no, no. Avoid a Roman kitchen like the plague. They're dark. They're dingy. They're smelly. This one is unusual. It has windows. But one thing it also has in common with many other kitchens, there's the cooking platform. It's not an arga, there's no burners going through it, it's a flat platform. It's raised hearth cooking. And there's the toilet. <laughs> Cooker, toilet. If you don't understand germs and cross infection, it makes an awful lot of sense to put dirty things together into one space. And that's just what the Romans did. And lots of kitchen utensils. <laughs> yes, I know. Uh, the dormouse jar. And there's Squeaky the dormouse, um, who is young and hasn't eaten very much. Remember that when you see the show. Um, there's something that, according to Apicius, the Roman recipe writer or collector, 
you cook dorm ice under, it's a portable oven, a clibanus. There's the typical cooking pot and tripod. Remember, you're cooking on a platform. No burners, so you need to raise it or put it right into the ash. And there are the cooking facilities for a poorer house, uh, the equivalent of a baby belly, if you like. Um, and that's a kettle, and it's still got the lime scale on the inside of it. And there, squeaky the dormouse, inside a dormouse jar which has a ramp running round the inside, not so they can keep healthy, <laughs> but so they can get the cups for the, for the, well, beech nuts, as the specialist told me. They love beech nuts, which were abundant around Pompeii. Um, and air holes so they can breathe, because you put a lid on to make them think it's hibernation time. And they eat and eat and eat and get fat and fat and fat. And then you cook them. Um, now, the Romans knew there was something wrong about the kitchen. There's something wrong. They don't understand what. So they call on the gods for help. This was found near a toilet kitchen in Pompeii. Isis Fortuna, a blend of the two goddesses, looking after a young man who is relieving himself, protected by the snakes of good fortune, as we saw on the Lararium scene with Vesuvius. And some wag has written over the top, Cacator cave malum, which can only be translated as ca crapper, take care <laughs> you're in a dangerous place now for the last section of the exhibition I wanted to see what happened when the Romans take their ideas culture and agriculture and move to Britannia and guess what we take to it immediately first thing as we saw with the Italian side is the gods and you have British gods you have the mother goddesses but you also have an invasion of the Mediterranean gods this is from my native museum at Sirencester, and you can see Mercury, the god of travellers, the god of messengers, shopkeepers, but in Britain seems to have a much greater importance. You find sanctuaries to Mercury all over the place, and there he is with his cockerel, the bird, the cockerel, and <coughs> Mercury is, if you like, at the vanguard of all these Mediterranean gods, including Bacchus, including Jupiter, including all of them. Now, the debate about ale or wine, we have a focus in the exhibition third section on beer production. Mm -hmm. Ale wine, well there's this myth that the ancient Britons had beer and then the Romans came along and brought their wine, well guess what, they brought both. There's no evidence for beer production in Iron Age Britain, sad to say. It really does look like it came with the Roman legions from Germany. So beer, guess what? is German and when they were digging the Bloomberg site in central London they found a waterlogged deposit filled with wooden letters. We asked Vindolanda, we asked the British Museum whether we could borrow the famous Vindolanda tablets and they said no. So we went to the Museum of London, we said can we borrow the Bloomberg tablets and they said yes. So we did and the tablets are fascinating. Originally they were wax filled you had two leaves or more and hollowed out wax filled and on the outside you had addresses written and these are two addresses a third tablet in the case has a letter so the addresses are fascinating this is to Tertius Brachiarius Tertius the brewer and this is Junius the cooper and the third one is Crispus the drayman so we've got beer brewing, beer barrelling and beer delivering. And this is only 10 years after Boadicea has burnt London to the ground. The forum hasn't been rebuilt yet, but the beer industry is swinging. <laughs> so we've got our priorities right. Um, and luxury imports too. We've got liquamen, which is garum, a form of garum, coming from Antipolis, Antibes in the south of France. We've got tuna chunks coming from the south of Spain. So Roman Britain, not only London, but cities like Silchester, cities like Roxeter, cities like Chester, are importing these luxuries. The diffusion of the food revolution is quite extraordinary in Roman Britain. Rabbits, chickens, beetroot, cabbages, plums good eating apples, good eating pears. All of these come with the Romans, they're not native to us. Uh, we've got pewter in the exhibition, not too much silver from Britain, but pewter. And 
Remember, even in death, the Roman Britons want to be seen as good Romans, so how do they do it? They show themselves banqueting. And three amazing tombstones from the Grosvenor Museum in Chester show just this. Roman Britons, doesn't matter that you're in Chester, the edge of empire, you're a good Roman and you want people after your death to see you as a good Roman, so you show yourself banqueting with your little three-legged table, just like the Romans in their frescoes. You're Roman, even if you're from Chester. You're a Roman citizen. This lovely lady, Curatia Dinizia, even her name is partly Greek and reflects the god Dionysus. So she's even got a name that links to wine, holding proudly her cup of wine aloft. And death comes to Pompeii. This incredible lady is from the Emporium. You remember I said that 60 people died in one of the storerooms, including this lady. Now normally, when the archaeologists made the casts, they cast them in plaster of Paris. They decided to make one cast in resin instead. It was fiendishly difficult because the resin dissipated through the ash. Plaster of Paris is gloopy and it sticks. The resin didn't. So what they did, it was almost as if they were casting a bronze statue. They put wax into the void first and then replaced it with the resin. And the result was this lady, the resin lady whose bones you can see, whose jewellery you can see through the resin. That's, that's why they did it. They wanted to be able to see the person for the first time. They've never done another one since because it was too time consuming and too expensive. This lady therefore is unique and the other thing about her is she is real. When you see her you are looking at a real person. She is not a copy. All the other Pompeian casts that you see in exhibitions including the exhibition we did in, in London six years ago, all the white casts are copies because they're simply too fragile to travel, whereas she is real. So when you see her, just remember she's a real person who witnessed the eruption. And she had gold jewellery with her, this. She had a jug that she was probably drinking from practically in those terrifying last hours. But the other amazing thing is, when you look at her tummy, you can see beads. And these are cheap pottery beads. So as well as gold jewellery, she had carried with her in her purse, by her tummy, she carried a cheap necklace. Why? I believe it was probably something of sentimental value. Her daughter gave it to her, her grandmother gave it to her. But as well as the gold jewellery, which was valuable, she carried this cheap set of beads. We can't finish with her because it's too desperately sad. It reminds <coughs> us that Pompeii is not Disney. It was a disaster. It killed thousands of people. It wiped out an ecosystem. And it gave us this incredible gift. It's very much a two-edged sword. We can't finish with that. Let's finish with the afterlife. Because when we saw the fresco at the beginning, this is what the resin lady was probably hoping for in her afterlife. She didn't have a funeral with offerings to the gods and a beautiful tombstone. She wanted an afterlife like this, where she'd be dining, reclining with her loved ones in luxury, with her little three-legged table piled up with drinking vessels, food and drink, dining into all eternity. And that's what we can give her back if we think of it. Thank you for listening, and do come and see the exhibition. Thank you.